Welcome to Voices of Change, a podcast for the Get the Medications Right Institute. We are on the cusp of a new era of specialty medications and gene therapies that will transform care. But we are also seeing tremendous waste. Annually, over $528 billion is wasted and 275,000 lives lost due to non-optimized medication use. Misuse, overuse, or underuse of medication therapy can lead to treatment failure, a new medical problem, or both. Consider some of these statistics. One in 10 Americans take five or more prescription drugs. More than 75% of all physician office visits result in a prescription for medication. Annually, more than 4 billion prescriptions are filled in U.S. pharmacies, and 50 to 75% of patients do not take their medications as directed. But there is good news. There are opportunities to control the loss and waste, whether you are involved in receiving, paying for, or delivering care. Living in a world where patients get the right medications the first time is attainable. That's what we're doing at the Get the Medications Right Institute. And that's what you'll hear about on Voices of Change. And here's your host, the executive director and co-founder of the Institute, Katie Capps. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. My guest is Diane Davis, MPH, Vice President, Community Wellness Department at Partners in Care Foundation. Diane has 30 years of experience in healthcare administration, managed care, and gerontology. She's been with Partners for close to 10 years. At Partners, she oversees community wellness contracts for evidence-based programs with federal, state, county, city, health systems, and private foundations. Welcome to the show, Diane. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. So, Diane, can you share with our listeners a little bit about the work at Partners in Care? What are you doing now to address social influencers of health? Sure. We've actually been an organization for almost 25 years now. And that entire time, we've been working to align social care and medical care. That was really the vision of our CEO, June Simmons. We work with the clinical care system, which, as you all know, spends tens of thousands of dollars on medical care for an individual, only to have it all negated when the person gets back into their home, where their social determinants affecting their life come roaring back at them. For instance, someone is discharged from having a heart attack and bypass surgery. They come home and they live in the San Fernando Valley in California. It's summertime, it's 100 degrees outside. They have no food in the refrigerator and they don't have an air conditioner. This person is really likely to end up back in the hospital, which is not what anybody wants for them. Our approach to social care coordination is to help to make sure that the progress achieved with the medical care isn't undone once the person gets back in their home. So for example, as part of our approach to social care coordination, we'll check to make sure that the person can follow up with medical appointments so they get reconnected with their primary care physician. And if they don't have transportation for that, we'll arrange for it. We also do medications check. It's called Home Meds, and it was developed here at Partners almost 20 years ago. It's a cloud-based system. And what we do is we take a complete inventory of all the medications that the person is taking in their home. So that will include the prescribed medications, any over-the-counter medications, and any herbals that they might be taking. And you'd be surprised what we find in some people's homes. Then proprietary algorithms identify any unnecessary therapeutic duplication, any fall risks or confusion related to possible inappropriate psychotropic medications, and any cardiovascular issues related to medication use. We also have a discussion with the person about how they're taking the medications to make sure that they are taken properly and there aren't any adherence issues. Once all the information is entered into the system and the algorithms are run, the system automatically alerts a pharmacist who does a review of any issues or concerns. Then a report is generated that suggests modifications to the medications 
And that report is sent to their primary care physician and any other prescribers. It goes to the patient and when appropriate, it will go to a family member or a caregiver. Wow. That's amazing. And, and that is a much needed service at the community level. I think that's, that's, a, that's awesome. Um, I, and I'm sure, as you said, being in their own home setting, you discover a lot that one that might be going to a physician's office to do a brown bag check may never even discover. So I think that's terrific. One of partners' values is developing innovations through your efforts focused on new ways to effectively promote health-producing behaviors and establish supportive services that enable high-risk populations to achieve optimum functioning in community settings. What are some of those interventions and services that you are starting to implement at the community level? And, and in light of that, what, what have you found to be the most effective or successful? Yeah, so, you know, we use home meds a lot, and we use it in conjunction with uh, care transition programs. So those are programs that help people transition from the hospital to home and make sure that they don't end up back in the hospital again. So when a care coordinator or a community health worker goes into the home to make sure that the patient is reconnected to their primary care provider, that they have food, you know, same kind of things that I discussed before, that they have food in the refrigerator, that they understand how to take their medications, um, we'll take that full end inventory that I described previously, and we'll make sure that they have not been prescribed any duplications on discharge. You know, sometimes when they're discharged from the hospital, they may get prescription for a brand name medication that's the same as a generic that their primary care physician has prescribed for them. And that can create huge problems. We also, by sending that community health worker, that care coordinator into the home, that person's a BA, social worker generally, or even a lower level staff person. And that person can go into the home and find you know, a lot of information, gather a lot of information. And that allows a licensed person to really work at the top of their skill set, which is what we're all trying to do in healthcare these days. And that person at the top of their skill set, the nurse or the person with a master's in social work, they can do the oversight and the direction, but they're not the actual one who's going into the home. The care coordinator will also check for any fall risks. So they'll look around the house and make sure there's not, you know, r- little rugs or there's not electrical cords running across the room, that the lighting is okay so that the person isn't falling or tripping because they can't really see where they're going in the home. And then they'll get modifications made to the home so that it's appropriate for that particular patient. So that really what we look at is pretty simple. Um, You know, we look at the food, like, do they have food in their home? Do they have a refrigerator that's running? Is their house filled with, with vermin so that it's, you know, really not a healthy place to be? And then we make sure that we give them assistance to it pay for any electrical bills or any heating bills. So we really just connect them with the services that are available to them in the community. So Diane, who who supports your organization, the Partners in Care Foundation, and in what way would an individual access your services? I mean, these are terrific benefits for anyone that is transitioning from one setting to another. Tell our listeners a little bit more about who supports your organization and in what way they can access services like this and what your your catchment area is. Yes, so we actually operate on a number of different levels. We get funding for our short-term case management services. So the transitions of care that I talked about earlier, we get uh, funding for them by contracting with most of the major Medi-Cal plans in the Los Angeles area. Um, But we also have a network of providers across the state of California. And so we can take uh, a contract from like a Blue Shield of California, and we can provide services all across the state. We're a hub, what they call a, a hub, similar to like a physician hospital organization or another kind of organization that can do the contracting for, with a managed care plan and then get the services provided all over the state. So 
We also have medical waiver programs, and those are the programs that are more long-term uh, support services. So we will take people on, you know, from whenever they get uh, enrolled or referred to us and all the way through when they pass away in those Medi-Cal waiver programs. And they're really programs to keep people out of institutional care and in their homes. So that oversight happens in their homes, which is where most people want to age. Right. So if I had an Aunt Mildred, say, and and she was in need of services in the California market, because you, you serve the state of California primarily, correct? Correct. Although we do have, we do work on a national level. Our CEO, June Simmons, and one of our vice presidents, Esther Safilian, now work with the Administration for Community Living and a number of national managed care plans on putting together these types of contracting hubs all over the country. So doing direct services, yes, primarily in California, but we have an influence on a national level. Which I think is wonderful. And certainly for our listeners, I think they recognize immediately the value of these types of services at the community level, particularly as it relates to ensuring appropriate use of medication um, because of the assessment that you do in the community. So, Absolutely. So if I had an Aunt Mildred in Los Angeles, and Aunt Mildred is a complicated patient. She's 87 years old. She's she's transitioning from the hospital in LA. She has a short stay in an acute rehab facility, and then she goes home. How would I how would I get a referral to your organization? Does that have to come through the facility? Does that have to come through my physician? Tell our listeners a little bit about how the referral process works. Sure. So in that kind of a situation, we really work with the managed care plans and they will tell us that they have a complicated patient in the hospital and that they would like to have this person followed to the home. And so generally what happens, we we have care managers that work in the Providence Health System hospitals and also in the UCLA Health System hospitals, and they'll go meet that person while they're still in the hospital, introduce themselves, and ask if it would be okay to have a visit at their home. And then, you know, so basically the referral starts with the plan and the care management departments at the plans. Okay. And the referral is made at that point and the patient is able to opt into the program at the facility level. Is that correct? Correct. They'll say, you say, yes, that would that would be lovely. I would like to have you, you know, because it's really getting them right when they're getting out of the hospital and they're not going to be comfortable having someone come to their home, you know, knocking on their door if they haven't been sort of introduced to that person or introduced to the idea of having that person come to their home right while they're still in the hospitals. Right. You know, we know the the risk factors. I mean, You know, we know one in 10 Americans take five or more medications and that, you know, 50 to 75 percent of those patients don't take their medications as directed. But we haven't even scratched the surface to as it relates to problems that occur because of lack of understanding and and what might be going on in the home. So I think this value added service is incredibly important. You can find more figures like this in our infographic, The Proof Points. Among the findings listed there are that medications are involved in over 80% of treatments and medical errors are the third leading cause of death. Be sure to check out our website for more information. Let's continue to listen. So so my Aunt Mildred has been referred by the managed care plan to this program and your care manager has met with her in the hospital setting and she has agreed to have you visit her in her home. As a matter of fact, she's delighted to have you visit her in her home. What happens next um, in terms of that activity? Uh, Just kind of walk us through a description of what might happen next, Diane. We'll make an appointment and work with the discharge planning office at the hospital to find out when exactly the patient is going home. And we'll make an appointment, go out to the home at the assigned time. And then we go in and we'll do a full um, assessment of the person in their home. So we'll look at things that I had talked about before, but we'll 
We'll definitely do the home meds medication inventory and have it run through its algorithms and see if there's any issues with medications. Check for adherence. So, you know, my boss tells this great story. It's not really a great story, but it's a good story of uh, someone who learned how, was learning how to take insulin. And that was explained to the person that by using an orange and the insulin was injected into the orange rather than, you know, injecting into, I don't know, a doll or something or the other. And that's how they were were shown what they were supposed to do. So when they got home, they shot insulin into the orange and ate the orange. Oh, So, you know, these are the kinds of things that nobody would ever think would be possible to happen, but they really, they really do happen. Um, And it's, it's simple things or things that seem simple to you and me, but they have just such a huge effect. I mean, if your refrigerator isn't running and you have no food in your house and you're 99 years old or you're your aunt Mildred and you're 87 years old, you might not know how to go on the internet and order food, right? You might, or you might not have the money. I mean, maybe not your aunt Mildred, but someone else may not have the assets to be able to pay the extra. So what we do is we really look at the whole person and we really look at, you know, what are the most critical needs and try to get those things taken care of. You know, we can get, uh, ramps built for them. So if, if they're in a wheelchair, they can get in and out of their home. Um, we sometimes buy those lift chairs that help people, you know, stand up or be, sit down. People with Parkinson's off, often need something like that. We really look at the whole person, as I said. I think that's terrific now, and, and particularly as it relates to that full assessment. So so now my Aunt Mildred is in the program. You have visited her and she's again delighted to see you and remembers you from her hospital, the, her hospital visit with you. How many times do you come in and assess her needs? Is it a one-time evaluation and assessment, and then you serve as a hub to her other care providers, or do you return? To, tell us what that looks so, like. So, so generally, it's it's really up to the program, and we have been, you know, we work with each of the different plans, but you know, every organization has a little bit different idea of what it is they want and need. So sometimes we'll oversee that person for the first 60 days out of the hospital. Sometimes it'll be for 90 days. But it's on on these transitions of care interventions, it's never longer than 90 days. And there's one sort of major, you know, big assessment. And then it's working to make sure that all of the needs that are found on that assessment are then taken care of over that 60 to 90 days. And one of the most important pieces of that is reconnecting them to their primary care physician so that and making sure that they have transportation and the ability to get to that visit so they're reconnected back into the medical system. You can see more patient success stories such as this in GTMRX's use cases on our website, www.gtmr.org. Now, back to the show. Right. I think that's, that, and, and you were right, because the ongoing relationship is with the primary care provider, and you serve an important function of bridging between the facility-based services and the community-based services like their primary care provider, and then and then bolstering up, I think, those activities to make sure they're safe and, and are doing what they were instructed to do in the hospital. Yeah, I think it's really surprising the many people who, you know, I, I did uh, care management myself for a period of time, and I think it's very surprising to people, you know, what you actually find when you go into the home. And, you know, you don't necessarily know that someone's a hoarder when you meet them, you know, outside, and then you go into the home and you find these issues that really get in the way of of recovery. And the person often, if they're older, you know, in their 80s, 90s, uh, you know, we have centenarians like that we take care of. So, you know, they're really not able to, to perhaps organize things and take care of things in the same way that they were able to do when they were in their 50s or 60s. Yeah. So, yeah. 
No question about that. And and to your point, uh, um, with your example, the wonderful example that you offered with the orange, you know, they could be a diabetic patient and they have no running water for foot care in the home. I mean, and that has been totally overlooked. So, and to that point, you know, you are working to address disparities. And so tell us a little bit more about your target patients. I mean, who are they? You know, who are the people in the program and how you've mentioned to us how they're identified. It's a referral based type activity. But but how do you address those disparities? I mean, now that my Aunt Milbert has told her next door neighbor about these services and she's highly interested, how might others in the community access those? And and how do you address issues around disparities? Sure. So we we really don't, we've thought multiple times about, um, you know, having fee-for-service clients, but we really don't. We really um, focus on low-income and diverse, high-utilizing population in L.A. County. So that's been our focus for the entire 25 years. So unfortunately, I mean, you know, because we do get calls from people that, you know, would be willing to pay for this service. And, but, but that's just not our population at this time, you know, so we have those managed care plans that we work with in the health systems that we work with and get referrals in the way that I discussed already. But we also have these Medi-Cal waivers and that's actually the even larger part of the population. And those, those are those low income, diverse, high utilizers. And those are all through Medi-Cal waivers and also Medi-Cal managed care plans. So through the Medi-Cal waiver home and community-based alternative program, we provide services to clients all the way from babies to centenarians, like I said before. Wow. All all these clients are in the program because they're at risk uh, for nursing home or institutional placements. So, and many are vent dependent. And in this program, uh, we have more clinic, obviously more clinical oversight, but it's still those basic social workers that go into the home and and do all the things that I've already discussed, making sure that the person's on the right meds and that they understand how to take the medication. And this program is has oversight by nurses, so it's got clinical oversight. Then we also are a big provider of the new program under California's Medi-Cal waiver for enhanced care management. It's called CalAIM. I don't know if you've heard of that or not, but it's a big new program in California. And it's really looking at the top 5% of utilizers in the Medi-Cal program. And often these folks are really difficult to find. They're homeless, many of them, not all of them, obviously, but many of them are homeless or they have significant uh, behavioral health or substance abuse issues. And it's really our job to find that patient first, which can be very difficult. And we can work with their primary care providers to do that. And then to meet them really where they are and try to enroll them in as many social services as they're eligible for and willing to accept. And that's a really key point um, that you can't force people to accept services. And it's very frustrating sometimes because you, you may know that you really could do something to help this person. But if you work with them long enough and you're, you gain their trust, you use uh, something called motivational interviewing to really find out their motivation. Like, what do they want to change in their life first? Right. And then you can, you know, begin to help them adopt healthy or healthier behaviors. Well, and we know there, you know, when we're looking at patient-centered care or patient-focused care, you know, there's been a long time phrase, nothing about me without me, um, but you, you, it is important to get their consent. And certainly as it relates, I mean, you do that from the beginning, it sounds like when you visit them in the hospital to, to get their consent to enter the program. And as you go through that process, to some degree, you're the conduit between community services and that patient, and you're their, you're their enabler once they get in at the community level. So let's talk a little bit about the home meds program, just, to, just briefly. Um, I think I find this fascinating, particularly the algorithm that you've created. In working with the pharmacist, I'm assuming that part of your assessment process is gathering information about who their local pharmacy is you already know who their primary care physician is. What's the coordination that occurs between the community pharmacy, the primary care physician, 
and the um, Partners in Care Foundation employee. Okay, so I'm sure that you know the conundrum um, that can can happen there. So, you know, like I've said before, we go into the home and we collect the full inventory. And as part of that, we also ask questions uh, of the client, things like, you know, um, how, have they had any recent falls? Uh, how many do they drink? If they drink, how many beverages do they have a day? How many times a week? If possible, we'll get a blood pressure reading. Not always possible, but sometimes we can. Then we'll ask them the adherence issues. You know, do they understand how to actually take the medication? So all of that information, along with the name, you know, we'll, we actually look at the bottles that the, for the prescribed drugs and, you know, we'll see what pharmacy it, it was uh, fulfilled in. And we'll put that pharmacy into the, the database. You know, we're connected to the MPI database for all the providers. So, you know, they can look up not only primary care providers, but, you know, if they have a cardiologist or a rheumatologist or another kind of physician that is prescribed medications for them, that information will be input as well. So we, you know, and a lot of times we have more information if they're going to multiple pharmacies, which we know some people do, we'll have more integrated information than we'll really be anywhere else. So all of that goes into the system. And then there's algorithms that were based on the beers criterion yeah. initially. Yeah. And those, those algorithms will look at about five or six different conditions that are specifically high problem for older adults. And we're actually, interestingly, we're actually just beginning with an advisory group to take a look at uh, more populations because of the fact that we're now, you know, it used to be the partners was really focused on the older adult population. But now with some of these new waiver programs, like I said, we're seeing everything from babies through, through centenarians. And we also have like the homeless population or populations that have, they're not 60 and over, but they have some really specific issues. Right, um, right, right. So we're actually beginning to try to develop some new algorithms to go into the system so that we can work better with those populations. Um, so do you assign a risk score to those individuals after you? No. Uh, no, it's not. It's not like a risk score. But w what happens is, if if there's something that's found, like someone's taken a psychotropic medication and right. they've had two or three falls, right? Or somebody has, I don't know, they're on some sort of medication that possibly could affect their blood pressure. Those are the types of things that will pop up, and then the system sends that to a pharmacist and it can be either a it could be a community based pharmacist that whomever it is that is contracting with us to use the home med system has chosen in their own community and we're in about 26 states uh, with home meds so it could be a, like i said a community pharmacist that's contracted with a community based organization that's using home meds we also work with a, a group of pharmacists called farm united out of texas and they are sort of our, you know, if, if the organization that's contracting for home meds doesn't have a community pharmacist to work with, then we can offer them to work with Farm United. There's some pharmacy schools that actually use home meds. And so, you know, they will use their pharmacy students um, with oversight to do the reviews. And then once the review has occurred by the pharmacist, and about 60% of home ed interventions require a pharmacist review. So we find something wrong in about 60% of the cases, assessments that go into home meds. Wow. And then... I guess that's not a surprise to us when we know that 275,000 people die a year due to non-optimized medication use. And, and we waste about $528 billion a year. So I guess the 60% of the time finding something wrong should not be a surprise to us, but that, but that is alarming, isn't it? It's a big number. It is. I was very surprised when I first learned that. Yeah. yeah I think it's, I think it's, it is amazing. Yeah. And so then, then the, that the report that's generated, 
you know, based on the pharmacist review and the pharmacist will say what changes they think should be made, then that report is sent back. There, there's two different reports. One is sent to the physician, the prescribing physician or physicians, depending upon which it is. And the other is sent to the patient. And the things that not included on the patient report are things like concerns around maybe they're drinking too much or they have some other substances in the home that, you know, look questionable. That will go back to the physician, but it won't go back necessarily to the patient. Very interesting. So what kind of, given the fact that you find that in 60% of the cases, there's something wrong and you address them, clearly you address them through outreach to the prescribers and to the other professionals on the team. What are some of the outcomes that you see for individuals that are in your model in relation to, to other organizations that might be providing these services? Well, I don't honestly know. I mean, I'm sure there are. Yeah. But I don't actually know of another system that goes into the home in this same way. I know that there are systems that are used in, you know, physicians' offices and in hospitals. But I think that what's key here is, you know, you go into the home and you just find stuff that it, it's shocking what you find, <laughs> you know. So it, what I do know is the outcomes, this, the positive outcomes, both to the patient by, by finding, you know, if you find something that is causing them to be dizzy and fall multiple times and you're able to correct that, the quality of life change for that patient is tremendous. It's also a huge savings to, to the system, right? Financial savings to the healthcare system. Because if you can stop those falls, you know, a single fall, a single hit can cost, what, thirty to $50,000? Right. So, so if you can keep, you know, 100 people, 1,000 people from having a fall that causes a hip fracture – you've saved a significant amount of money and right. and a significant amount of human suffering. So it can only be positive. Right. No question about that. And, and, and when we're speaking to, and of course, with medication related um, issues, similarly, that, that could create, if, if medications are not being used right, or if they're the wrong drugs, that could create something like a fall, Absolutely. Not, you know, not just the obstructions within their house, but the, the wrong meds. So I, I, I find this very um, interesting and very useful for any homebound or later homebound individual that's transitioned from one setting to another and certainly can see the utility and the benefit of it. Diane, for my Aunt Mildred or those that might have an aunt similar to Aunt Mildred, can you tell me one of the, the single most important reasons that they might consider an individual from Partners in Care Foundation visiting them? What's the number one reason that you see value of what you do on a day-to-day basis? I just think we really look at the whole person and we meet them where they are. Um, and we listen to what they want to do to improve their health care or their health. And, and we start there. And it's amazing to watch people transform, really. Um, you know, you, you list, if you listen to them and they make incremental positive changes in their behaviors and in their surroundings, you can really change a person's life. And, and we, you know, I wish I had prepared uh, more stories of, of really how that's happened, but we hear them all the time from our case manager to case managers. Well, we um, will invite you back to share some of those stories with us, particularly as it relates to, to um, activities surrounding medication use and how that might have impacted their ability to, 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 to play with their grandchildren or to visit their community or to go to church or to, you know, all of those turnaround stories that I think are so important. We will definitely invite you back for that, Diane. I want to give you an opportunity for a final word here. I, I, I think that, that it's important to give you that opportunity and also let our listeners know how they might reach your organization if they have further questions. 
Sure. So uh, I just want to really thank you for the opportunity to to talk with everybody. Um, it's been fun. And, you know, I, I think medications are just such an important issue, particularly as people are aging. And they have obviously uh, proven to do miraculous things. I mean, we can do things now that we just couldn't have even dreamed of, you know, 50 years ago. So, so there's so much positive that's come out of them, but it's a, it's a surprise at how people really don't understand how they're supposed to take their medications. You know, we found people that take, will take all their medications at the same time in the morning and they're supposed to, you know, be taking them three times a day or they have to take them with food. So I just think it's such an important issue and, you know, whatever we can do to save human suffering and, you know, with the baby boomers aging, you know, to save our economy, it's really important stuff. So I, I just want to thank you for, for having me here. And I also would like to let everyone know that they can reach Partners in Care about home meds at, at home meds at PICF.org. And um, if you send a message there, it will get uh, responded to quickly. And certainly you could always look me up, uh, Diane Davis, and I'd be happy to speak with anyone about home meds or about the work we do at Partners in Care Foundation. Thank you so much, Diane. And to your point, you know, I don't know if our listeners are aware of this, but you are certainly aware of this. But every day in the United States... 10,000 people turn 65 years old. So uh, I think this is definitely a much needed community service, and, you know, because the, the number of older adults will more than double over the next several decades to top 88 million people. And it's going to represent 20% of the population by 2050. So we are, I am glad that my Aunt Mildred has access to services like the services that you provide. And I thank you for your time today. And we look forward to having you back as part of our podcast. Great. Thank you so much, everyone. All right. Thanks so much. A big thank you for the supporting members of the Get the Medications Right Institute. That marks the end of this episode of Voices of Change. Thanks to our listeners for tuning in. To learn more about what you can do to help get the medications right, please visit us at www.gtmr.org. Until next time, be well. Partners in Care Foundation is a strategic partner of the GTMRX Institute, and their support is crucial to the work we do. GTMRX relies on financial support from those who share our mission and vision. We would like to thank the organizations who have already pledged their support to our work. These organizations include our founding funders, the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, Johnson & Johnson, and the American College of Clinical Pharmacy. Our executive members, California Chronic Care Coalition, Kaiser Permanente, Tabula Rasa Healthcare, and the Department of Veterans Affairs, and our strategic partners, ABV, the American Association of Colleges of Pharmacy, American Association of Psychiatric Pharmacists, Amgen, Association for Accessible Medicines, Avira, Breast Cancer Index, Cleveland Clinic, Coalition of State Rheumatology Organizations, Curator, MPRX, Genentech, Genomind, The Journal of Precision Medicine, Kimber Booth, LabCorp, The National Alliance of Healthcare Purchaser Coalitions, One Ohm, The Partners in Care Foundation, FactMI, and the Teachers' Retirement System of Kentucky. Their support is essential to advancing CML.